Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon to who is in person uh, at the International Environment House, uh, and good morning, good afternoon or good evening to who is with us uh, on WebEx or is now watching the video of the event. The Geneva Environment Network joins today the Friends of Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform and the International Institute for Sustainable Development in warmly welcoming you for this hybrid session on subsidizing fossil fuels in times of high energy prices, looking at the fossil fuel subsidy reform in trade and climate discussions. Discussions in which the international community in Geneva plays an important role. In a few weeks from now, we have important uh, international conferences and negotiations taking place in Stockholm, Bonn and Geneva, and of course also partially online, for which the discussion we are having today comes at a timely moment, and with a lot of inputs for those that are not happening in Geneva from the international community in Geneva. We have with us today trade and climate experts to outline how they look to address the energy pricing crisis strategically throughout these uh, various forums. This session is also registered as part of the OFF program of the European um, Energy Transition Conference, a festival for the general public proposing over 170 events in Geneva and the nearby French and Swiss regions. Before we proceed with the opening remarks of this event, uh, and I hand over to the moderator of today's journey, a quick comment on the pandemic. Almost all the remaining measures have been lifted at the United Nations Secretariat uh, in Geneva, and our premises return to normal occupancy. We have been doing uh, efforts uh, in making our events hybrid and hope to inverse the current trend, which is 10% of the attendees in the room and 90% online. Uh, so the future is definitively hybrid and these tools allow us to have also people who are not based in Geneva joining these events. And coming back to this event, a quick reminder for those who are online with us, you can raise your questions by using the Q&A box, which we will address in the Q&A session of this event. Now, it is my pleasure um, to leave you in the hands of Peter Wooders, leading the energy team of the International Institute for Sustainable Development here in Geneva, to guide you throughout this event. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Diana, and welcome everybody online and in the room today. Um, as Diana mentioned, uh, really interesting and important topic today. We're talking about fossil fuel subsidy reform. We all know how important fossil fuel subsidy reform is. Uh, it's leading to very high levels of greenhouse gas emissions. It has adverse impacts on trade, on the economy, on the environment, on social issues, and so on and so forth. So we must reform fossil fuel subsidies. They are inconsistent with the Paris Agreement and, and meeting 1.5 degrees. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're easy to reform. And today, in normal times, we would be talking in particular about the trade system and fossil fuel subsidies. We'd be talking about the UNFCCC and subsidies. And we will be concentrating on both those issues today. And we've got panelists um, who you can see online or in, in person here who are very expert on talking to those topics. But we also have to be aware that there were very high energy prices before Christmas um, leading into the, into the end of last year and the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine has only made this work worse and there are now very serious concerns about energy security and high fossil fuel prices in many countries around the world. One of the issues that's coming up from that is that there are certain countries who are either introducing new fossil fuel subsidies or thinking about doing so or are extending basic sort of tax holidays and some of the other mechanisms of fossil fuel subsidy reform longer than they would normally have done. So we've got here you know, a, a, a sort of classic juxtaposition of short-term um, needs from countries and also the long-term needs from countries. We know the, the end point of this. We know that we have to move away from fossil, fuel sub, from fossil fuels in the long term. We have to move into green solutions. And fossil fuel subsidies are working against that necessary energy transition, not for it. So you know, how do we deal with the short term and the long term um, together? So that's the, the conversation we're going to have today. And we're going to focus really today on three things. On trade, on the UNFCCC and on crisis response. So I'll keep coming back to those three uh, topics today. Uh, got a set of panellists. Um, her, Her Excellency Ambassador Claire Kelly from New Zealand is tied up at the moment. She'll be joining us a little bit later. 
Uh, so we'll we'll move on um, with the other panelists first. The way we want to do things today is we've we've gone for a uh, no slide conference. So it's all about being interactive today, about questions, about opinions, about discussion. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to begin with um, a couple of questions to get us moving. Uh, they will give. Um, responses over sort of five or six minutes and then we'll move into a Q&A in the second half of the session and there will be plenty of time for that. So I will introduce the panellists as um, as I first ask them to speak and the first person I'm going to ask to speak is Anna Laura Lizano who is a who is the second councillor at the permanent mission of Costa Rica to the WTO here in Geneva. She'll be known to a lot of you on trade and sustainable development debates uh, in Geneva, very experienced um, professional in this area. And Costa Rica has, of course, played um, a leading role in the discussions that we've had on trade and sustainable development and on uh, sustainable development more generally with, it, with its history over many, many years. So delighted to have her with us today. So. So, Anna, if I could start with the first question to you, and I think be one of a lot of interest to people in Geneva, but also online. Um, status and plans of fossil fuel subsidy reform under the test structured discussions. Thank you, Peter, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. I am delighted to be here. Definitely, it's a great opportunity. To let you know a little bit where we're standing uh, in the structured discussions for trade and environmental sustainability, specifically uh, when we talk about fossil fuel subsidy reform. So right now, as you might know, uh, well, and for those who don't know uh, yet, uh, TESDI is right now co-sponsored by 71 members of the WTO. And uh, throughout the discussions that we've had um, last year, and beginning of this year, we established four informal working groups uh, with thematic uh, topics that were uh, mm -hmm. focused and had the uh, main objective of delving deeper into the discussions more substantively and more technical, um, more, uh, discussing more technical aspects of four the four main priorities uh, that members came, came about. And those were environmental goods and services, trade-related climate measures, uh, circular economy and circularity, and subsidies. Under the subsidies, informal working group is that uh, fossil fuel subsidy reform has found a place for its discussion. And we are very encouraged about the interest that this, this has uh, awakened in the membership, in the broad membership, not only among the co-sponsors. And as an example, I can tell you that uh, last March, at the uh, second formal uh, meeting we had where we presented this in formal working groups, we had to extend the allocated time we had for the meetings because the interest in the topic was so huge that we had to allocate an extra half day. So there is uh, a lot of expectation from this informal group of technical work, uh, particularly we're going to try and identify the environmental effects and trade impacts of relevant subsidies. And this includes not only fossil fuel subsidies, but also the members have um, asked to discuss agricultural subsidies, among others. But these are the two main focuses. And then we are expecting to have a broader understanding of these impacts and identify where are the information gaps. This, of course, has been taking place uh, with the support of stakeholders where IISD has been an incredible aid and, and has been helping us shape the conversation, giving us a lot of uh, science-based uh, data, channeling the, the discussion a bit more focused. So for us, it is very important to have the participation of stakeholders such as IISD, but also OECD has been helping us a lot and academia. And uh, in the case of agricultural subsidies, we've had the support of UNEP. So um, we believe that there is a very big opportunity for the members to understand uh, the thematic and the problematic of fossil fuel subsidies. And this is where uh, we believe that the the place for, for this discussion 
can be can be settled uh, within this informal working group. So we are very happy to have had this chance of launching the discussion uh, with more dynamism and more activity than than before. Thank you very much, Anna. I'm sure we'll come back to to test D and, and what it's doing and, and what it's going to be doing going forward in more detail as we go through the discussion. Um, Anna, you're also our, our national representative today from from Costa Rica, obviously, but uh, and Costa Rica is one of the 10 members of the Friends of Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform Group. Um, I won't embarrass people by asking uh, the audience, well, who are the other nine? I will do that one for you. It's Costa Rica, Denmark, Ethiopia, Finland, Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and Uruguay. And each of those countries, like countries around the world, is now thinking, um, you know, you've been through COVID, uh, or we've been largely through COVID, it still remains a problem in many countries. There's now increased energy prices. We've now got um, concerns about security, about, um, about energy prices going forward. You know, how, how are you thinking in terms, as a national government in uh, how, do, how do you balance all these crises together and you think about crisis response and at the same time trying to be strong on climate change? Well, first, uh, I think it's important to make a, a, a tiny disclaimer that uh, a new government took office two weeks ago. So, um, well, bas but basically Costa Rica doesn't change dramatically in policies when it comes to trade or environment. So, uh, we're happy to say that uh, we're going to continue uh, in, in the path that we have been following so far. But indeed, uh, one I think one uh, great news that we had from this new government taking office is that our new Minister for Environment is a former IISD president and CEO, and he was uh, in office from 2010 till 2012. So that is certainly uh, a, a, good, uh, a, a good message for us as, uh, from the very beginning. And um, we have been very ambitious from uh, the start from, you know, uh, this development model that we follow that is over three decades old, uh, where trade and environment go hand in hand. The both agendas are trying to be uh, hold very strong synergies and env environmental goods and services is one of the agendas that we are very interested in. And definitely with a uh, the the war in ukraine happening at this at this point in time we have been impacted therefore we believe that we need to take at least small steps but strong steps towards uh our plan to be zero emissions and decarbonized by 2050. Um, currently we have pilot programs on uh, electric bus routes for example where we still have a lot of work to do we uh, fortunately have a renewable electrical grid, which is 100% renewable. And of course, uh, we are active participants of the ACCTS negotiations where fossil fuel subsidy reform is a strong, strong pillar. And um, definitely our goal in this, in this negotiation, in this pillar is to transition to renewables. And um, we understand also that challenges that this negotiation has has brought because it, it is so brand new in its in its nature but uh, we're working with a very strong uh, technical team back in capital uh, we're working on the job of de getting definitions on having the uh, transparency commitments also sorted out and uh, it is interesting that uh, in the ACCTS negotiations all of the participants were EGA members except for Fiji, and all of the ACCTS uh, members are TESD co-sponsors. So there is a common understanding, a common sentiment there that this is something important that needs to be, um, that needs to advance and move, move forward. So in general, the, we are dealing with the very difficult times, these challenging times, in this in the trade agenda through this through these efforts and we believe that there is a space for you know opportunities here for us to to try and tackle in in our capacity what is going on abroad super thank you anna and i think that's a you know if i sort of paraphrase the the 
some of your last intervention there is you know crisis as, as, a, as a possibility for opportunity as well i mean it's, it's clear what the end point of this is the end point is that countries around the world undertake successfully the, the green energy transition the green transition and it's whether we can use this crisis to do that more quickly than before or whether there's going to be forces that are working against it um, I mentioned that Anna was the only representative from national government on the panel today. That was completely wrong because I've now got um, Her Excellency Claire Kelly, uh, who's New Zealand's permanent representative to the WTO with us today. Um, Claire, thanks for joining us. I know how busy today is, this week is, this, this month is, and there's all the things that are coming up in June with the ministerial and everything else. Um, Claire's got a great background. She's been in Geneva before at the mission uh, a few years back, um, working as a councillor there, and has also been New Zealand's ambassador to Mexico, um, and has worked as well as the, uh, before her appointment here in February of this year, Assistant Secretary in the Trade and Economic Group at uh, the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign and Affairs of Trade, and a lot there on Trade Negotiations Division. So, Claire, thank you, well, thank you again for joining us and, and for bringing your expertise to the session today. Um, and I think one of the questions we get asked all the time is, you know, are, why fossil fuel subsidies and trade? You know, what, what's the link there? What are the impacts? Why is it important to be looking to deal with fossil fuel subsidy reform through the WTO and through trade more generally? And be really interesting to hear, interesting to hear your views on that, um, including, you know, as Anna, Anna mentioned, anything you've got to say on the, the progress of the ACCTS and, and you know, what, what we're looking forward to at MC12 as well. So, Claire, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. Um, thanks for the invitation to be here today. Sorry to be a little bit late. Um, I mean, I, it's, it's an interesting question that you've put, which is um, pretty broad. Um, uh, and I think everybody in this room is well aware of the um, need to transition away from fossil fuel subsidies. Um, we have a particularly acute uh, demonstration of why we need to do that right now. It's in, um, it's certainly in, in most WTO members' immediate interests, and probably all of them in, in longer term interests, to reduce our reliance on um, fossil fuel subsidies and support a transition away from fossil fuels. Um, and New Zealand's strong view is that trade policy has a vital role to play in supporting um, efforts to mitigate um, climate change and adapt to it. And fossil fuel subsidies work against those efforts to address climate change by artificially lowering the cost of fossil fuels, as the name suggests, and encourages their um, ongoing use. So um, how do you tackle that, which is um, that, that policy tool, which is costing governments um, about 500 billion US dollars a year, which is, you know, an extraordinary amount. Um, New Zealand um, identified this issue as one we wanted to um, to be at the forefront on a long time ago, and um, as part of our overall approach to all environmentally harmful subsidies, be they um, in agricultural fisheries or um, in re relationship to energy, and um, so we we pursue outcomes on this. Um, everywhere we can, basically, um, in our regional and um, plurilateral, in the regional and plurilateral trade architecture that we're part of, um, in smaller groups, um, bilaterally, and um, of course in the WTO. And um, so it is a long play and you have to be patient. And um, I would say that a, a very important thing is for the objective to outlast electoral cycles, obviously, um, because um, uh, our political masters want results much faster than the WTO can generally deliver. But if you're able to take that long-term view, um, things can be achieved. And as everyone knows, um, agriculture and fisheries and the subsidies that contribute to them are active um, avenues of discussion and reform in the, in the WTO process. And we're starting to get that a similar kind of, um, you know, action underway on fossil fuel subsidy reform. It's, it's taking a while, but um, that's not for a lack of um, attention or acknowledgement. 
the G20 and the APEC, the 21 APEC economies have committed to action on fossil fuel subsidies, or they committed to it in 2009. And since then, um, they and others, such as the Friends of Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform, the V20, and I must confess I don't really know what that is, the Pacific Island Forum leaders and the G7 have issued statements calling for the phase out of fossil fuel subsidies. And of course, all UN member countries have endorsed the need for fossil fuel subsidy reform in the Sustainable Development Goals. And the World Health Organization has recognized fossil fuel subsidy reform as one of the prescriptions for a green COVID-19 recovery. So it's very clear all the signals are going in the same direction. Without, unless we tackle um, fossil fuel subsidy reform use, we won't be able to reach the goals set out in the Paris Agreement. Um, so the way New Zealand is approaching this, in addition to our own domestic review and reform of indirect support measures, we um, are continuing to advocate actively internationally for fossil fuel subsidy reform. And um, in addition to the environmental fora that exists for having these conversations, we're also looking to advance um, the issue in trade and economic institutions. Because subsidies affect trade and investment decisions and competitive environments for renewable energy, um, reform of fossil fuel subsidies is a key policy tool for internalising the environmental cost of um, emissions. And the first place we're driving this conversation is at the WTO, um, which is well equipped to address disciplines to address such subsidies, given its existing legal frameworks, transparency mechanisms, and the history that it has generated in disciplining other subsidies in the same category, more or less. And last, at the end of last year, in December 2021, we, um, uh, along with other 45 WTO members, launched the Joint Ministerial Statement on the Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform. And of course, that aims at building a um, supportive environmental setting uh, sorry, an important international setting and eventually a supportive an environmental setting for addressing fossil fuel subsidies multilaterally um, as well as to assist domestic reform. And in taking that work forward, we are, um, we are conscious that we need to take into account um, the specific needs and conditions of developing countries um, and minimise potential, any potential adverse effects on their development. And we're hoping that by encouraging information sharing and experience sharing of reform in the WTO, um, we can achieve transparent and effective disciplines that will have a, um, a multilateral uptake. And we're looking forward to the next phase of this work, which is um, a work program that supports the objectives of the joint ministerial statements. Um, we're always looking for more co-sponsors and um, we need a diverse range of views and experience and different levels of development amongst proponents to ensure that we get a robust outcome. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about using the Asia Pacific Economic Forum Cooperation Forum APEC as well as a, as a means of um, advancing this particular issues of ours. And um, last year, um, APEC members committed to a voluntary standstill on inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, mm -hmm. which um, is a practical step that, um, that we believe has taken us forward. And that was while we were the host of APEC. But now that um, Thailand is in the chair, we are uh, supporting APEC economies to hold the, regionable, the region to account to its pledge to tackle inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Um, Anna has already um, talked about the ACTS, I think, the, oh, we call it the ACTS, the um, ACCTS, the Agreement on Climate Change, Trade and Sustainability, um, and uh, I think has, has given you a good um, sense of, of what it aims to do. Um, which is to explicitly use trade rules and practices to, to support sustainable development and climate goals. Um, and our intention is that it will develop disciplines that are comprehensive, transparent and consistent with WTO rules, and will consider the development dimensions of implementing fossil fuel subsidy reform. And I think it is a very interesting coalition of countries that's, that's taking forward this work. 
and that's a huge strength for it because um, the way it's shaped uh, should allow it to be sufficiently robust to come into the quite grueling WTL environment in due course. Um, so we will keep working on that initiative with the hope that one day we can expand it into a multilateral one that um, will be open to all WTO members who are prepared to, to meet that standard. Bilaterally, of course, too, we work in our, um, our trade agreements on um, trade and sustainable development chapters which cover environmentally harmful subsidies, including cooperative commitments mostly at this stage on fossil fuel subsidies. And if you have any interest in that, they can all be found on our um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade website. So um, I'll stop there. Other than to say, other than to note, as I'm sure many others have, that the context, the global context supports exactly what, what we're all doing. And um, it's the time to accelerate the transition towards greener energy systems. And so we have, we have history on our side. <laughs> Thank you. Super. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And thanks for that excellent summary. You know, we, we know where we need to get to here. Also really interesting to hear you know, the very wide range of initiatives that, that New Zealand's involved in, you know, multilaterally, plurilaterally, bilaterally. Uh, and it's very clear that you know, when we look at the international framework for fossil fuel subsidies, you look at any international process or forum now, and there's some sort of um, commitment to reform. Um, so we've got this sort of high level cover, if you like, and the high level imperative. And now it's about uh, helping to turn that into to action in, in all the sorts of different ways that we may do so. Uh, that leads us nicely on to our third panelist today for opening remarks. It's Joy Kim. Hi, Joy. Welcome. Very good to see you in person. After after a while, we've all been uh, interacting virtually as everybody has. Um, Joy is with uh, the UNEP based here in Geneva in the other environment house in building number one. And uh, she's been working a uh, long experience on macroeconomic environmental policies for 20 years, uh, was previously at OECD. Um, Ho mentioned before that um, she moved quite some time ago now, about 10 years ago, um, into UNEP and is leading fiscal policy work in green economy for Africa at the moment and various all sorts of other things around GGKP and fiscal policy more generally and has been um, UNEP as well is the custodian for um, the indicator you've all heard about, SDG indicator 12C1, which is about the reform of subsidies, uh, fossil fuel subsidies, uh, and they've led that. And the first question Today, I wanted to ask you, uh, Joy, was, was around you know, that SDG reporting, but about transparency more generally. And you know, could you just tell us a little bit about why is, is this transparency so important in, in fossil fuel subsidies? And I think as well, practically, what, what sort of services and training are, are you at UNEP sort of leading and coordinating around that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And good afternoon, everyone. And good afternoon, everyone on the, online. Uh, it is true that it's my first uh, intervention in person over two years. So it feels a bit weird, but I'm sure that I would actually adapt to it. Uh, rather than the virtual images, the real person uh, images that I am facing right now. Um, as Peter mentioned that UNEP as a custodian to the SDG 12 uh, C1. So as you know that the SDG 12 requires countries to rationalize inefficient fossil fuel subsidies by um, removing a market distortions. And it has a specific indicator to measure fossil fuel subsidies as amount of GDP. Uh, as the amount of subsidies per GDP, both on the production and then consumption side. Um, and you might actually have a heard a range of fossil fuel subsidies from 500 billion to 5 trillion US dollars, uh, figures from uh, IMF, for instance. And you wonder why there is this kind of disparity. And the reason why is because the different organizations actually use the different methodologies to calculate fossil fuel subsidies. Although it's interesting to see in the case of IMF uh, figures that actually included the environmental externality cost in there, but it can also cause a confusion. So we developed the methodologies uh, in terms of how to measure fossil fuel subsidies and the methodology was developed together with the OECD and then IISD. Back in 2019 uh, was launched, I also had the chance to present it at the WTO uh, on the methodology itself. 
Um, and hopefully we hope, uh, hope that it would actually provide the guidance to countries in terms of how to measure uh, fossil fuel subsidies. Um, and it is also true that there has been a number of different international databases available on measuring fossil fuel subsidies. As I mentioned, there is OECD database, there is IMF, IEA, and all that. But I would say that the process of SDG is very different from all these uh, globally available data that you would actually see because this is a very much bottom of approach. We encourage countries to collect data and then report and measure uh, faster fuel subsidies. Um, and it's an opportunity for countries to begin to also coordinate within themselves because we uh, experience that in some countries, it's a Minister of Finance who is actually dealing with these subsidy issues. And in other countries, it's the Energy Ministry who is dealing with these issues. And there seems to be a little bit of disconnect among the, the ministries on you know, the volume of fossil fuel subsidies they are providing. So in the SDG process, officially, um, countries are asked to designate a national focal point for this SDG indicator. And in many countries, it's actually statistical department. So now the countries have to uh, coordinate within the government about the statistical department as a national focal point, together with whatever the ministries will actually have been dealing with these uh, fossil fuel subsidies to organize and coordinate and then to understand better about the volume of subsidies they are providing. We have uh, first called for a submission on this data uh, in March this year, and we are ex uh, extending the deadline until June this year. And uh, we at least tried to call for a submission a quarterly basis this year because this is the first year that we are actually asking countries to submit data. And I, uh, we do see that there is still uh, quite a bit of a capacity gap, if you like, in many countries to start um, measuring and collecting data on fossil fuel subsidies, as we do see that there is a disparity between global data, for instance, on fossil fuel subsidies and what countries actually submitted as a fossil fuel subsidies, because in a number of countries, they said they have absolutely no fossil fuel subsidies being provided, as opposed to that is not the case when you look at the global database. And I think that this uh, also may not be surprising because we learned that in some countries, they don't actually um, have a definition or the call something uh, as a fossil fuel subsidies, although they may actually have energy subsidies. So in terms of the confusions on definitions, the scope and how to measure fossil fuel subsidies, it is all included in the methodology. And in order to provide the support to countries, uh, to start uh, really digging up the data and then understand better about how to measure fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, UNEP, together with all the other partners that includes OECD, IEA, IMF, uh, IISD, uh, as well as the UN uh, regional body, we have been providing a regional level and sub-regional level capacity building uh, training on how to measure and report fossil fuel subsidies. We have developed a template that countries' national focal point can actually fill in. And we have de uh, delivered so far uh, one in the Caribbean region together with the UN ECLOC and other partners. Uh, and then the, the other one in Latin America, we have just delivered one in uh, East Africa with the UN ECE. And the next coming uh, up uh, workshops and training is one in uh, Europe with the UNECE and another one in West Africa. And then we would have uh, cover, we would actually cover the Asia Pacific regions together with the UN ASCAP in June uh, this year. So that hopefully this capacity building uh, training workshops would actually uh, alert countries that this indicator require countries to look at their fossil fuel subsidies and learn how to measure measure it and then report for the SDG process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joy. So I think some really important points came came out of that intervention there. Firstly, you know, often people will say, you know, there's no definition of fossil fuel subsidies and no agreed methodology. Well, there is an agreed uh, definition. It's the ASCM under WTO. It's got 164 members and they've all signed up to that. And then the methodology under SDG 12C1 um, goes into further detail then about how you define subsidies and, and what to include and what not to include. And as a personal reflection, a lot of the, when the debate comes to, you know, we don't agree that we've got subsidies or we, we don't agree with the definition, what countries are really saying is, we think that some of the subsidies we are giving are good subsidies. So they're not arguing that they're not subsidies, but 
you know, that's the way it comes out. So, and also very interesting joy to hear about the, the efforts that um, UNEP is leading on training around this and capacity building. Um, in order to have proper subsidy reform discussions in countries, you need informed public debates. For informed public debates, you need nationally generated and agreed information um, better than international, uh, and that gets things going. I just wondered, Joy, if you had any quick, um, you've, you've been watching the sort of energy and climate world for a long time. What differences are you seeing you know, since the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine in terms of subsidies and how countries are thinking of them? Are we, are we seeing some new subsidies being introduced? What, you know, what's your sort of uh, observation so far? Uh, I think at that point, perhaps Anna was alerted to it a little bit. I mean, I, I, I guess that many countries might be also alerted about this increasing price of uh, energy and also the food price as well. Uh, and then we do see there's a movement that the countries may actually want to increase even the subsidies on pesticide as a part of agriculture subsidies and the uh, fossil fuel subsidies as well. But I think it's interesting if you actually look back at the very beginning of the recovery, we actually have been saying that this is a very good opportunity with the energy price, you know, uh, plunged uh, for countries to actually reform fossil fuel subsidies. But when you actually look at whether countries really took actions and took advantage of their opportunities, it is actually not the case. And it, they actually went to the opposite. When you look at the recovery spending, it was an unprecedented uh, you know, amount of government spending uh, went for recovery. So 17 trillion US dollars uh, for like 86 countries were spent for the recovery. And of course, to cover the pandemic crisis, but also the economic fallout associated with the pandemic. And then out of that, the green recovery that we actually have calculated together with the University of Oxford uh, amounted to only a 970 billion uh, US dollars. And um, unsurprisingly, if you actually look at the G20 countries and how much they actually have uh, you know, provided the support for uh, carbon intensive and fossil fuel intensive industries, uh, that amounted to 233 billion US dollars. And if you look at the 34 major economies, 40% of their budget as a part of the recovery actually went to support the fossil fuel subsidy, uh, fossil fuel uh, intensive industries. So I am not actually sure that the current crisis that we uh, have uh, with the energy price increase would actually, you know, necessarily indicate uh, countries that this is uh, not a good moment to reform fossil fuel subsidies. I understand that there is a political uh, challenges that countries may actually face, but you know there are some lessons that we can actually draw from the recent experiences of recovery that rather than spending and investing in uh, you know short-term unsustainable expenditures such as fossil fuel subsidies, you know, it is actually important to, to consider investing for a long-term, uh, you know, low-carbon solutions. And in addition to that, I think that the currently there are many co countries facing a very severe fiscal constraint, um, you know, of course, to also support the, the current uh, pandemic crises and others. But for them to, to uh, you know, go back in track on sustainable development goals, achieving sustainable development goals and financing SD, uh, SDGs, um, they need to consider, you know, what inefficient government expenditures they can actually, you know, revisit and how they can also uh, sort of release a little bit about the, the currently very severe fiscal constraint. When you look at the, the debt ratio of GDP, uh, of course, during the, the recovery period, but, you know, between 1920 uh, and 19 and then 2020, Advanced countries, the debt ratio of GDP actually amounted to almost 90%. And in uh, emerging economies, it actually amounted to almost 40%. So this is a very uh, severe fiscally constrained uh, period. And we also know that the fossil fuel subsidies uh, and then its fiscal burden is swelling. So if countries are not actually able to address these uh, fossil fuel subsidies, which is very fiscally heavy, one, when they're actually facing very physically, uh, con uh, you know, severe constraint, they are likely to actually pay a higher cost later on if, we de if they don't actually invest in uh, the long-term solutions. And we all also know that, you know, by just using a 30 to 40% of fossil fuel subsidies, 
we can actually pay for a, a clean energy transition. So this is also, I think at the very beginning it was mentioned that it can be opportunities and countries can actually, you know, rethink about how they can make a long-term low carbon uh, solution oriented uh, uh, decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joy. Um, excellent points there. And, and this the sort of need to invest in the long term into low carbon solutions um, ever more clear. Uh, our next speaker, really pleased to introduce somebody else who's very busy at the moment, lots going on and lots going on in June. Um, it's Aiko Lim. He's the director of the Trade and Environment Division at the World Trade Organization. been in place there for quite some time and is responsible for the organization's work on trade and environment, also on the agreement on technical barriers to trade um, and has had previous roles in the uh, WTO, including around trade in services. So uh, very expert on all sorts of elements about the WTO and how it works. And uh, it's been interesting the last few years how, how much more central the WTO and the trade um, architecture and agreements have been to the issue of fossil fuel subsidy reform and you know from efforts from yourself and, and from Ambassador Kelly New Zealand from also and from Anna and from all sorts of other countries as well. Um, so Ho, we wanted to ask you, you know, firstly, you know, it's been described that there's a sort of revitalized agenda on trade and environmental sustainability now. And if, if you could just elaborate a little bit more on that and give us give us an idea what that's all about. Well, thanks very much, Peter. And you know, again, a pleasure to be here, to be in this in-person um, seminar webinar. Um, well, it's not a webinar, actually, it's a hybrid. Um, sorry about that. Um, so, you know, coming at the end after hearing all the other speakers, um, I think Anna and Ambassador Kelly has really provided you with a very comprehensive uh, overview of the initiatives, um, those particularly on fossil fuel subsidy and those covering the wider spectrum of trade and environmental sustainability at the WTO. So maybe before getting to the, the more process related questions on, on trade and environmental sustainability and, and what's going on at WTO, I was also listening to the debates here about, um, about fossil fuel subsidies right now and, and what can be done given this uh, very difficult juncture uh, with uh, inflationary pressures on the economy. And it struck me that the first point, you know, even before we get to, to, subsidi to subsidies, is essentially the need to reduce the demand for fossil fuel. I mean, it seems like a very naive point to say, but essentially it's all about getting towards a structural change where the economy has less reliance, less need for fossil fuel, full stop. So now, if that sort of transition uh, can happen, uh, in a sense, you know, issue of subsidies becomes a bit less prominent. Of course, you could say it's a chicken and egg question that how do you get to that juncture uh, whilst you are at the same time subsidizing? Um, but that seems to me what, one of the big sort of crux to, to this sort of challenge that we're talking about. And here it might be useful to go back to, to um, what the Glas Glasgow Climate Change Conference, COP26, you know, um, and if you look at the, the Glasgow Climate Pact, the, the wording here is interesting because it, it calls upon the parties to accelerate the development, deployment, and dissemination of technologies, adoption of policies to transition towards low emission energy systems, including by rapidly scaling up the deployment of clean power generation and energy efficiency measures, essentially accelerating towards uh, clean tech. You know. And it goes on. Okay, so but we just take that first bit. Um, I, I think what we need to be thinking about, or I should say, the members of WTO or governments more generally, need to be thinking about it in a wider range of policy instruments that they have at their disposal to accelerate to make this structural change possible. Fossil fuel subsidy reform is one very major part of it, but it's not the only one. So you could think about other policy instruments out there. And I think Ambassador Kelly and, and also Anna already talked about this, environmental goods and services. Uh, if you are going to go towards this rapid scaling up and deployment of clean power uh, generation, 
you know, it, it, to me, it stands to reason you need renewable energy goods, you need renewable energy services, you need a whole spectrum of, um, of uh, technologies that will allow you to make this acceleration possible. And that comes to another point, which I think is evident to most people, but we've not seen it easy to see something done with. Uh, tariffs, for instance, you know, um, uh, can it be possible to reduce tariffs on goods that are needed to make this uh, transition possible? Uh, it's been tried a few times. It's still being tried under the Acts, and we are hearing in coming back to WTO and the test D. So that's one policy pathway to think about. Uh, it's not only goods, it's also services. Uh, in, in some cases, maybe the services aspects may even be more of an obstacle than goods uh, because renewable energy generation needs lots of services. So if you have very high barriers on services, it's an impediment to make precisely what the Glasgow Climate Pact is asking for. So th those are really a few levers to, to think about. Um, another is something that we don't deal much with at WTO, it's not really within the scope of WTO, but um, I think it's a very important uh, driver, which is finance, uh, finance, investment, climate finance, etc. And how do investors see different transition pathways? Do investors still want to invest in fossil fuel? Or do they want to invest in, in clean tech and, and what may drive uh, value going into the future? And so the risk criteria between these two things uh, become very interesting because in a sense, the market itself can drive change. Um, what can governments do in relation to that? You know, I'm no expert on climate finance, but I, I would imagine that there are certain regulatory policies and instruments um, that could be used uh, in, in that direction. And, and then, you know, the, there's also ample uh, research out there, and there's one paper, for instance, by Joe Shapiro, which talks about the environmental biases in trade policy. And, and in his research, he basically points out that um, uh, dirty industries uh, face fewer tariffs than clean industries, uh, and there is an environmental bias here. And again, all of these levers, if used um, correctly and appropriately, can help do what I started with, which is to try to reduce the demand. Because if you don't reduce the demand, I, I, I think governments will continually be in this vicious circle of having to subsidize for sometimes, you know, very clear public policy needs, which is the impact on, on the poor and the most vulnerable. Uh, you don't want that impact. Uh, you don't want to hit those who cannot uh, afford fuel, uh, and you need to find a way to help them as well. But you end up in a vicious circle unless you find different ways to, to basically make that structural transformation possible. And again, it's here in, again, the Glasgow Climate Pact, where it says, you know, you know phase out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies while providing targeted support to the poorest and most vulnerable in line with national circumstances and recognizing the need for support towards a just transition. So it's already there. It recognizes many of the things that people have already said about why it's so difficult to just have an abrupt change to the system, or not, notwithstanding also the inflationary uh, crisis that we are facing. But it's not unique to the fossil fuel sector. Uh, any sector that has been heavily subsidized faces these adjustment pressures. And it's not easy to, to reform, we know that, but you know, in other sectors, we've also seen the need for other policies to come in to deal with adjustment costs uh, to help precisely the poor and most vulnerable. But I think the critical point here is that are you helping the poor and most vulnerable uh, when you subsidize? How can you make sure that the subsidies are really targeted? Again, I'm no expert on subsidies, and I think Joy knows more, Peter, uh, Philip, but it seems to me a, a question to ask, you know, uh, you know, how do you design subsidies so that you're sure that they are doing precisely what the Glasgow Climate Change uh, Pact talks about, and not just subsidizing so to keep an industry going uh, for other reasons. So those are just a few thoughts uh, on, on, 
on what else one could be doing. More specific, and I'll finish here because you know I didn't want to go too much into this because it would just be repeating what uh, the uh, Ambassador Kelly and, and uh, Anna have already said. But, but certainly at WTO, uh, we've seen a lot more uh, interest and a lot more, if I could say, uh, activity. Uh, but more than that, we've seen three ministerial statements launched last year. Uh, the test D ministerial statement, the, the one on plastics that we've not spoken about so far, uh, and of course, the fossil fuel subsidy reform uh, ministerial statement initiative. So that, in a sense, is quite historic uh, for, for the WTO to have these three statements come out. And those were the only statements that, uh, no, maybe I'm wrong, but I'd say the most prominent, maybe it's because I'm biased here, uh, statements to come out at the end of last year. And they came out in advance of MC12, which was... Uh, suspended, but will now take place in June. Um, and in a sense, you know, it, it is interesting that they are, in fact, ahead of MC12. Uh, and there's a lot of very uh, interesting discussions going on uh, at the WTO, getting down to the more specific points, as Anna said, in the work uh, program and the working groups as to how do, how do we make progress or how do members make progress. And here, I think one, one th key point, I, I think, will be that uh, there needs to have much more developing country participation. They're already there. It's not without developing country participation, but certainly that could be uh, enlarged. And the good points here is that, you know, we do hear more developing countries speaking up in, in the meetings on TSD, certainly in IDP, and I'm sure that will be the case with fossil fuel reform. Uh, when it starts to have its meetings uh, take place during this year. And, and, and that, if we are able to do that, would really do what you said, which is that uh, a revitalized agenda at the WTO. So, so thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Ho. Um, excellent intervention there and, and really interesting to hear you sort of show that, that fossil fuel subsidy is only one part of the picture here, that there's all sorts of other things that need to happen in, in trade and other regimes around you know, the prices of goods and services, relative access, um, tariffs, and so on. Um, the role of the WTO, uh, the links into the three ministerial statements. And then um, uh, I think on a much more flippant note, you know, anyone who says I'm no expert obviously is an expert. So I think I'd like to be in that position one day and I say I'm no expert on this and then say something really expert. Um, you also set up the, the conversation on um, the UNFCCC and the links into the Glasgow Pact. And I want to bring in our last panelist speaker today virtually. It's Laurie van der Berg, who is the Global F Public Finance Co-Manager at Oil Change International, which is a, uh, a leading NGO um, pushing for ambitious climate solutions um, across a wide range of issues. Um, her particular work is focusing on the just transition through moving governments and financial institutions away from continued financing and permitting, um, uh, away from the, the financing and permitting of the expansion of oil and gas. She's previously worked at Friends of the Earth Netherlands and was played a major role in the the, the sort of groundbreaking climate court case taken against Shell, um, which led them to change their policy um, with regards to future emissions and commitments thereof. Um, so, Laurie, thank you very much for joining us today. We wanted to hear from you, firstly, a little bit about the, you know, a lot, a lot of, you know, a, a lot of um, comment has been made and excitement has been raised by having the issue of fossil fuel subsidy reform in the UNFCCC. Um, and just wondering, you know, from, from your role as a campaigner, as, as an activist, um, what does this mean for climate action? And you know, how is this going to go forward to COP27? Is it going to lose momentum? Is it going to strengthen? I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on that to begin with. The floor is yours, Larry. Um, thank you so much, Peter. Just checking if you can hear me okay. Very, very well. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, well, thanks ISD, the Friends Group, and the Geneva Environment uh, Network for organizing this event. Um, I apologize for not being able to be with you in person, but I am very grateful for the opportunity to join online. Um, so, Peter, you mentioned uh, the COP decision, um, and it's including a reference to fossil fuel subsidies. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I'd say this is an important breakthrough. Already at the first World Climate Conference in 1979, it was acknowledged that fossil fuels are the single biggest driver of climate change. And yet this is the first time a COP decision explicitly acknowledges the need to phase down fossil fuels and phase out fossil fuel subsidies. And this could provide an important building block for further progress on this topic. Um, I say uh, could, because as we have already heard today, this is not the first time countries have made this commitment. The G20 committed to end fossil fuel subsidies more than 10 years ago, and the EU committed to end environmentally, sub environmentally harmful subsidies without delay in 2013. Um, since then, we have seen countries participate in voluntary peer reviews, and we have seen them remove some of their fossil fuel support. But often subsidies have later been reintroduced or replaced with new subsidies. And to date, um, no gold standard examples exist of countries that have adopted a roadmap towards a full phase out by, the, by a set date in line with their existing commitments. Um, take my own country, the Netherlands. In uh, 2015, it signed a French communique calling for an end to fossil fuel subsidies. But up until 20, 2019, the government claimed that the Netherlands did not provide any such support. Um, after an OECD and IEA review of the Netherlands fossil fuel subsidies, the government has now agreed to phase out subsidies for gas in the horticulture sector, but it has increased subsidies for gas extraction, introduced a new subsidy for CO2 neutral gas fire power plants, and more recently, uh, it has lowered energy and fuel prices in response to the war in Ukraine, a measure that is predominantly subsidizing high income rather than low income households. Um, I'd say that rather than introducing new fossil fuel subsidies, and the other panelists have also already made this point, governments should now uh, more than ever use their public resources strategically to reduce uh, the demand for fossil fuels and reduce dependency on um, uh, these vo volatile uh, energy sources, whether they are produced in Russia or domestically or elsewhere. Um, they also have an opportunity to introduce a windfall tax on the profits of the oil and gas industry, uh, the revenues of which can be used to support low-income households that are facing high energy bills. Um, the science tells us that there can be no investments in new coal, oil and gas supply, and that the emissions from existing infrastructure already bring the world beyond 1.5 degrees of global warming. And more recent research shows that investments in energy efficiency and renewable energy combined with an increased use of already existing fossil fuel infrastructure can replace Russian oil and gas without a need for investments in new long-lasting LNG infrastructure. Um, at the same time, governments are significantly underinvesting in affordable uh, clean energy solutions. And while shifting fossil fuel subsidies and public finance um, is critical to unlock the needed clean energy invest investments. This is, not, this is not yet happening at the scale necessary. And the reasons for this include political inertia, also a strong fossil fuel lobby, and a lack of public awareness. And I would add that the endless debates on fossil fuel subsidy definitions, though important, have also distracted from the necessary action. Another reason uh, why this is not yet happening at the scale necessary is that fossil fuel phase out, a fossil fuel subsidy phase out and fossil fuel phase out in general as well is not easy. It is difficult and it can go terribly wrong. There are plenty of examples of poorly executed reforms, such as the case of the Gilets Chance in France. But thanks to elaborate research, including by IESD, we also know how a fossil fuel subsidy reform can be done well. Um, among other things, this requires a transparent process involving cross-ministry collaboration, effective public communications of the reform plans, and also a redistribution of freed-up resources in a way that alleviates any negative impacts on low-income households. Um, so to come back to your question, Peter, on how we can build momentum towards COP27, um, I believe that we need a small set of governments uh, to lead by example. So there are ample of multilateral initiatives that are pushing for progress on this issue at the multilateral fora, but we need uh, to have a small set of governments that lead by example and that can set a gold standard that can be followed by other governments. Um, in my view, they should 
one, put an immediate halt to subsidies for fossil fuel production, two, avoid the introduction of new subsidies in response to the war in Ukraine, and introduce a windfall tax on oil and gas company profits, and three, adopt a roadmap for a full phase out of fossil fuel subsidies by the end of this year, including plans for redirecting resources to low income households and just transition support. Um, we've seen that small but ambitious uh, diplomatic initiatives can be effective in generating gold standard examples that can help drive progress at the multilateral level. At last year's climate conference, the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance committed to immediately end new licenses for oil and gas production. And another group of countries signed a joint commitment to end international public finance for fossil fuels by the end of 2022. And I believe that alongside the Friends Group and uh, the ACTS initiative, these initiatives create opportunities for countries to step up and deliver concrete and comprehensive action on fossil fuel subsidies by uh, COP27. If governments fail to act, uh, they are also increasingly likely to face litigation. Um, over a thousand climate litigation cases have been filed in the last six, year and there, six years. And there's already a first example of a fossil fuel subsidies case. Um, the UK government is currently being sued over its subsidies to oil and gas companies. I believe that if there is one lesson that we can draw from both the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, it is that bold political action is possible and that large sums of money can be shifted in a short amount of time in response to urgent threats. Um, the climate crisis is such an urgent threat and ending fossil fuel subsidies is a key part of the solution to the compounding crisis that the world is currently facing. Um, it's really critical that governments take comprehensive action now. Thank you. Super. Thanks so much, Larry. So bold political action is both necessary and possible. And thank you very much for laying out some of the things that would be uh, involved in such bold political action as well. So thank you all five panelists for your uh, for answering that first set of questions. We're now into the, more, the, the Q&A intervention side. Uh, I've got a whole set of questions in for, here in front of me on my WhatsApp um, from uh, we have about 100 people online at the moment for the event. Um, and I ask people as well in the room here today, if you wish to ask some questions as well, just put you put your hand up physically and I'll, I'll be able to see you. And I note in the room today, uh, we have representatives on the panel here from New Zealand and from Costa Rica, but we've also got in the room uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, Switzerland and Finland from the uh, Friends Group as well, who are currently um, undertaking a, str a strategy session on what they're going to do next to to push forward the issue of fossil fuel subsidies more generally. But I'm first going to um, give the floor to um, Christian Lau, who's a lawyer with the Sidley Austin Group, uh, LLP, based here in Geneva. And Christian, you've been doing some work on um, if there are going to be multi-country agreements on fossil fuel subsidies, what sort of elements need to be in those and, and how might they be um, formatted? So if you wanted to to make some comments on, on that, you know, um, I'd be very sure. happy to hear. That. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. Um, but let me first of all start by um, thanking the distinguished panel for a very insightful and, and engaging discussion. Um, I think I've I've learned a lot about the the politics around um, the 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 fossil fuel subsidy reform discussion. Um, we've, along with a couple of colleagues in um, our Brussels and Geneva offices, thought a little bit about kind of the content um, of a fossil fuel subsidy agreement and kind of what questions one would need to answer in. Um, securing such an agreement. I think it's possibly, we, we've talked a little bit about the, the uh, impact of the um, Russia uh, war in Ukraine on fossil fuel prices and how that has impacted subsidies. There might still be a good moment, despite those circumstances, to think more about the technical elements um, that one would need to answer or that one would need to address in, in setting out an agreement. One of the points I think we've, we've discussed a little bit, subsidy definition, um, a lot of work has been undertaken. Peter said there is a definition in the SCM agreement. That's true. There's an approach that's been taken in the agreement on agriculture that's slightly different. 
Um, but kind of making decisions on that definition up front, I think, is something quite important because it will frame the discussion on how um, disciplines should work. On the discipline side, again, there's lots of different options one could pursue, and uh, prohibitions, I believe, are kind of the most straightforward one. Hesitating to say straightforward, because on the fish side, it's taken a lot of time to actually reach an agreement, but it's the easiest understood um, discipline. There's also, and again, agriculture, um, uh, Ambassador Kelly has mentioned it uh, earlier, is an example where people have taken a different approach, namely quantitative limits, whether it, excuse me, whether it's the number of subsidies or the amounts of subsidies that, that, that could be subject to disciplines. There's also, again, in the SEM agreement, an effects-based discipline, which has been quite challenging to administer. And looking at environmental effects, it might be even more challenging to administer in the context. But at least it, it, it remains one option that countries could pursue. Um, standstill, we've already heard about that being put in place um, as perhaps an interim measure is something that, that could be useful. Or, of course, a combination of um, the, the disciplines that, that I've outlined a moment ago. There's also the development dimension that we've talked about. So how do you build special and differential treatment into the um, into an agreement and into disciplines where kind of the thing you're disciplining isn't purely economic? So I think we've, we're facing challenges at the WTO with this concept. Looking at fossil fuel subsidy reform, this, this might be more challenging yet because we're not looking at a purely economic question. And then there's questions about enforcement. I guess you'd um, expect a lawyer to, to mention that issue at least. Um, and the institutional framework. And what, what I'm keen in, in, in hearing from the panel perhaps in, in the second round is where you see the right fora to push that agenda forward. We've talked about um, the um, Last speaker just mentioned kind of developing a gold standard amongst a smaller group. Do you see that as the way forward? And, and if so, which is the right forum for that? And, and how do you see a process towards multilateralizing it? Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, and good to end your, um, your intervention there with a question um, to the panelists. I think it's a very good question as well. I mean, the, there's a, you know, a tendency within within fossil fuel subsidy world to say, you know, we need all of the fora. You know, we need the UNFCCC, we need the WTO, we need the G20, we need the G7, um, we need bilaterals, we need plurilaterals, we need multilaterals, and so on. Uh, maybe I could turn to you first, Ambassador Kelly, and just to say, you know, is is that right, or is is there is there a need here to focus in on a couple of things, a gold standard to use the ACCTS as the precedent setter for everything? You know, what was, what's your sort of advice to to the movement here, if you like? Goodness. <laughs> Easy question to start with, Tim. Um, I mean, our contribution is to try and build, if not the gold standard, something of a gold standard through the ACCTS, the Acts. And by advancing that work with a very diverse group of countries, um, we hope that we will come up with a set of standards that's both ambitious and broadly applicable or broadly attractive. Um, so it's it's often true, but not always, that um, smaller uh, agreements negotiated in smaller settings are more ambitious. But I mean, it's not always the case. I mean, the the current um, fisheries negotiation is. Um, if it achieves everything that is envisaged that it would, would, would be, would set quite a standard. And I mean, so that can happen, but more often it starts the other way around. And um, so, I mean, yes, this is our particular contribution to the approach is to start with the acts, see where we get to in terms of setting a very high standard with these like-minded um, countries, and then go from there in terms of broadening um, 
but there will have to be obviously a cutoff point at which you cannot allow for more dilution. Um, so I don't know if that's answered any questions, but that's certainly um, one of the ways in which we're looking for, we're, we're contributing to the effort. No, super. I think it's both both contributing and answers the question very well as well. And I think you know within this debate there are lots of discussions about you know here are some high level commitments and and here is uh, some ways we could move forward. Here's some of the elements we need to consider. But the ACCTS is actually trying to to make a negotiation around those in, and include all those, which has got to be of general use to everybody else who's, who's coming behind. So the, I think the precedenting setting power here is is very very high. And Anna, maybe you wanted to come on this as well. Thank you, Peter. And uh, I fully endorse Ambassador Kelly's comments. Uh, definitely, the ACCTS is uh, a trailblazing uh, effort, a trailblazing initiative that will set the standard for what what's to come. Um, the benchmark that the ACCTS can become for different the different issues not only ffsr but only the approach we take on environmental goods and services is going to be very very important at the wto and um it has a very comprehensive approach to both environmental goods and services but also on how we we see uh the reform of fossil fuel subsidies so um this can uh, we're actually very ex ex expecting this negotiation to to advance and and conclude soon to use it as a a kind of a model a reference for our discussions at the structured discussions we believe it's going to be um a, a very important milestone in in the negotiations at the wto thank you very much um, anna um, very helpful and then Turning, I've got a few questions here from the virtual audience. I'm trying to sort of make patterns out of them. It's really hard. Um, the uh, let's think. What's the, the best question here? I think there was a couple for you here, Joy. Um, there's one sort of slightly technical question here um, from Neil McCulloch. Thanks, Neil, for for joining us today and for your question. And Joy. I think the question is really about the sort of volatility in international prices. You know, we're, we're in a very high period of, of relative fossil fuel prices at the moment so you know that makes it um, difficult but necessary for governments to reform their subsidies when then when the prices go low again they say oh we don't need to do anything now because prices are low whereas you know the policy advisors would be saying that now as you said in your intervention now is the time to um, to intervene so you know what, what does that mean I mean it, it's very difficult to say what will be the the energy price profile we see as the energy transition picks up pace you know will we see lower prices um over time will we see a lot of volatility you know what, what's your sort of advice on just sort of dealing with this volatility issue because it never seems to be the right time to do things but let me ask you back one question do you think that the crisis that we are facing right now is the last crisis no <laughs> I mean, I think it's it's clear that the crisis will be repeated, and then it's one after another, unfortunately. So, what is what is the most important thing right now is really to see how we can build more shock resistant or crisis resistant, you know, a system or the economy, and you know what investment that we are making right now would actually help uh, to build such economy and we have already discussed about building back better building uh, green recovery when we actually first had the pandemic crisis and we were not actually able to grasp the opportunity and i think that it's the same thing it's not necessarily about the energy prices would actually fluctuate anyway you know in one way or another and i don't necessarily think that the the country's policy in particular when we are talking about you know meeting the paris agreement and delivering sdgs we need to actually fluctuate, you know, uh, together because it will not actually solve the problems that we will face. So if countries can actually zoom out a little bit and then, you know, think about the long term planning and the long term solutions, I think that the price of, of course, you know, the a little bit of the adjustment might be needed. Also, there is a strong element of political economy always playing behind. So I am not saying that, you know, that's something that we can completely ignore, but I think, uh, you know, countries, when they actually think about the long term planning and then building this more resilient system and the economy, 
I think, you know, what decisions need to be made when it comes to issues like foster care subsidies, I think it becomes quite clear. Thank you. No, really good advice. Um, and thank you for that. Um, there was also another question for you, Joy, in your sort of economist hat this time. Um, how do we get the true price of fossil fuels? How can that be established when we have to take into account environmental, health, social impacts, etc.? Are there estimates for these sort of prices available? You know, how should we take account of those? Um, so at least in our methodology, um, we actually have provided, I mean, by, by using the existing approach uh, developed by IEA, for instance, the price gap approach and the OECD's approach and the, the, the inventory approach, um, we decided not to uh, use the methodologies that the IMF used, which actually included this uh, environmental externality cost included. I think it's a useful exercise to uh, to actually calculate this environmental externality cost, but to call that as a fossil fuel subsidies, um, and then you know what to reform when we are t uh, talking about targeting subsidies to reform. Um, we we thought that that actually it's better to be separated. So I would say that the fossil fuel subsidies and subject to a reform, we actually have provided you know clear definitions and then scope and you know what to look at it in terms of measuring and reporting and then eventually reforming. But I think that the external uh, cost, environmental external cost. It actually provides a very good information in terms of its impact on our health through the air pollution and its impact on our nature in terms of its, uh, uh, or you know, or the, the 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 extraction of the fossil fuels and how that can actually impact on our nature and then water contamination and the land uh, degradation and etc. It's very useful, but we would not actually you know include it as a part of fossil fuel subsidies. Thank you. Yeah, so take account of it, but not necessarily uh, include it in the subsidy estimate. Um, and I think that's sort of getting the prices right in a nutshell. Thank you, Joy. Um, Ho, I'm not sure if this is really the question I should ask you, but I'm going to ask you anyway. The um, there's you know, obviously WTO has been part of um, you know, facilitating. There's been a lot of discussion on all sorts of different types of subsidies uh, at the WTO over the years: agriculture, industry. Um, and, and latterly fisheries and others as well. Uh, there's a question here from, from one of the, the virtual audience about, you know, often these subsidies are sort of, if you like, captured and, and become part of vested interests and you know, the various industries that um, continue to lobby and campaign for those subsidies and so on. And, you know, from, from your sort of history of, of watching how these things have unfolded in the WTO, how's the, how's, how have, how have uh, sort of countries being able to make progress, even though those invested interests are so strongly represented in some cases. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for saving the most difficult for the end. <laughs> but no, let me let me try to answer this question and maybe make a link a little bit to the first question that the colleague from Sydney Austin uh, started with. You know, I, I again, I don't think there's one single answer, but my my experience at least of what I've seen is that you get a better negotiation uh, if whatever you're negotiating has already has a sort of as, as much as possible a clear national position uh, and that clear national position has to come from a very consolidated view uh, of that country on that particular issue um, and when you come to something like fossil fuel subsidy reform which is so complex uh, it cuts across everything uh, that that government may be doing and that government is hopes to do, you need a whole of government approach. Um, and so, in essence, before you even get to the WTO negotiation, you need to have a national negotiation, if I could say, amongst all the parties, agencies, government um, groups, private sector, to decide where do you want to go with this. Um, and and hopefully, I mean, this is you know, one cannot say it's not one size fits all, but hopefully, the each country would recognise what I started with earlier, that they have already uh, committed to a direction under the Paris Agreement, uh, and in this case, on fossil fuel, and they marshal uh, everything they can to make that uh, possible. So 
it begins, I think, with that uh, basis to try to deal with the vested interests, so to speak. Uh, not easy, but it has to be dealt with at, 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 at the national level. If it's not dealt with at the national level, it's brought to the international level or multilateral level, if you like, and it continues and it becomes a, a sort of stumbling block, uh, which becomes very difficult to resolve because no government, and that's very understandable, will want to back down on a national position at the multilateral level, um, which is seen as giving in on its sovereignty in some way vis-a-vis uh, -vis stakeholders at home. So, you know, that, that would be one very general comment. And, and the last one to, to link to the first question is that my, I, I think, you know, when it comes to gold standards and things like this, um, you know, it's very, may, I'm, I'm not meant to be flippant, but I, I think you know, don't, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good, you know, essentially. And I, f I fear sometimes in multilateral level discussions, we go way too much down that way. Uh, you know, looking for a perfect solution and in the meantime, not taking any action. So the perfect solution is take some action, basically. Uh, and this links back again to political economy. I, I will put the questions the other way around. Deal with the political, political economy questions first on how you can get the deal and what's possible for that deal and then worry about the legal issues after. Don't start with the legal issues and make that a handicap to try to re, uh, reach any sort of uh, deal. So. But, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like a by, bystander, so it's easy for me to say that. And Ambassador Kelly is right in the ring. It's much harder to do, but, you know, those are just a few sort of general thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ho. Uh, excellent answers. And I, I'm beginning to get a challenge here. The next time I'm moderating to you, I'm just going to keep asking you more and more difficult questions until uh, potentially, well, maybe we'll see, um, one will be too difficult to answer. Uh, Larry, thanks for your patience on virtually. There's a question here, which is a bit, bit of a sort of statement, but it says government pension funds should start to divest in fossil fuel companies until there's a meaningful reduction in their carbon footprint. And I think that's that's bringing up this idea here of of how to sort of financial flows, how can that fit into this um, into this, this sort of fossil fuel subsidy discussion? Uh, I think you mentioned as well the um, the agreement that was made at COP26 on international public finance. So just any, any sort of quick reflections you've got around sort of public finance and finance flows and, and the fossil fuel subsidies? Any quick reflections on, on a, a very big topic? Um, yeah, I'd say that the the topic of international public finance flows and domestic fossil fuel subsidies, but also licenses for domestic oil and gas production are all very much interlinked. Um, the science shows that we need a rapid reduction in both the use and production of fossil fuels and um, subsidies and, and public finance and, and also government licenses for fossil fuels, of course, uh, contribute to an increased production and use of fossil fuels. Um, so we need governments to take uh, comprehensive uh, action across the board um, and across all of these different uh, policy areas. Um, I mentioned this decision that was um, uh, launched at COP, um, a, a 39 country and institution a strong commitment to end international public finance by the end of 2022 um, for fossil fuels. We've seen some uh, backlash against that initiative. It's a very important initiative that creates a huge opportunity to shift billions of dollars um, from fossil fuels to clean energy uh, action. And that's definitely something that we need to see happen right now. Um, what we've seen is a bit of backlash against this initiative where countries are saying, well, if you end international public finance um, for fossil fuels, you should also end domestic support. And if you don't do that, uh, your leadership is, uh, is um, uh, not complete um, and it's hypercritical. Um, so also for these initiatives that are focused on action at the international level or that are focused on just one element of the fossil fuel phase out challenge, um, need to really be complemented with domestic action and in this case also an end to domestic fossil fuel subsidies um, or an end to licensing for new fossil fuel production at the domestic level. So I'd say that these um, topics are all very interlinked um, and we need to see a comprehensive approach um, and a well-managed and well-planned decline of, of fossil fuel production overall. 
um, and I'll keep it to that. Thanks very much, Larry. We're, we're into the last five minutes. I think I've managed to paraphrase most of the questions we got um, from the virtual audience. Um, in terms of sort of summing up the session, I think we've heard that that fossil fuel subsidies, you know, are acting against the goals of where we want to go. Um, we need to keep going on the green energy transition. Uh, there's obviously lots going on in terms of the the trade and the UNFCCC, so the climate change um, uh, agendas and and uh, the instruments that are coming up under those, the agreements and so on. Um, lots of different instruments and initiatives we can have. I also think it's very important to see, and you can see from the panel today, we've got a mixture here of, of governments, of intergovernmentals, of CSOs. Business is also increasingly interested in this issue. We could have got voices from all sorts of business groups as well. So there seems to be a community here and an understanding that, that things need to be done about this issue. Um, just wanted to quickly give each of the panelists a, a minute each um, for some final remarks, but particularly about whether you know, does do the high prices that we see at the moment and, and the, the Russian war in Ukraine, you know, is this changing everything or is this a, a sort of, you know, a temporary issue um, that you know, is another crisis that we have to deal with, but the long term direction doesn't change. Um, we'll go in the same order that we did uh, at the beginning. So, Anna, you know, does, does this change everything or is this just you know, another crisis to deal with? Well, um... Thank you uh, again for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I'm I'm not in the capacity to say if this is the last again or, or one more. It's just, you know, what we have on the table and we have to deal with the cards that we've been served and try to, to manage it the best way we can. What we have uh, are the instruments. Definitely the multilateral trading system provides us with the instruments to tackle these kinds of situations. I think that we have um, we have opportunities that we need to, to take advantage of. And certainly um, at this point, uh, the situation, uh, the international situation for countries like Costa Rica that depend on international trade that are also agricultural exporters, this is not uh, an, an easy moment. But uh, certainly there are, um, we have the tools we are uh, friends of the multilateral trading system. We believe in it. And that is why we are also committed to have conversations on, on other platforms where we can discuss uh, subsidies to fossil fuel, uh, fossil fuel subsidy reform. We can also discuss agricultural subsidies. We can discuss uh, market access on environmental goods and services. We can discuss Anything in our agenda that has been ambitious, we are enhancing that ambition definitely and we're trying to look forward. We're revisiting these this, uh, discussions that we have been part of for, for quite some time and um, we are definitely in the, in the track of adapting to the situation we have in front of us with what we have already negotiated in, in FTAs, with, with what we have on the table, with ACCTS and what's to come. So we already have the experience and we are uh, well, just trying to do take the best of it uh, because that is our reality as a small economy. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Anna. Ambassador Kelly, to add anything to Anna's comments? Um, I don't have a lot to add to them, only to say that I, I don't think it changes everything, but it certainly reinforces why we should be doing what we're doing. I mean, it's a useful geostrategic reinforcement um, for what's been viewed as a predominantly um, environmental issue before then, but it does bring in those um, strategic elements um, that I think perhaps have been have been less at the center of people's thinking as they go forward in the transition from fossil fuels to greener energy. So that that can only help, I believe. No, thank you. I think that's a really important point. You know, it, it, not so long ago, how do you get secure energy of supply, oil and gas? Now we're thinking completely the opposite. So that's really changed. Um, Joy, a quick comment from you. <clears throat> thank you very much. I think that I have perhaps touched that upon a little bit. Uh, previously, but I think, you know, we probably need to think why this current crisis is actually hitting us very hard. 
it's because our energy sources are not diversified and we are not actually there yet in terms of clean energy transition. And then we have to think what is actually needed to achieve these things. And I think that when you actually look at where the money flows, we also have answer. Because when you look at the finance, where the money goes, as long as there is a lot of investment going in for uh, fossil fuel industries, then the money wouldn't actually flow for clean energy transition. I think that there was a question about the de uh, in divestment of a pension fund. We actually have a look at the sovereign wealth funds and where the money goes. There is a changing trends that there are many uh, pension funds that actually put the principle as a divest divestment from a fossil fuels, which is actually very promising trends, I would say. It can actually increase uh, further so that we also are sure that where the finance would actually go, uh, they can actually contribute to a clean energy transition. And I very much agree with uh, Director Ho, who actually mentioned that in order to achieve the, the bigger crisis that we are facing, like climate change and achieving sustainable development goals, I mean, fossil fuel subsidy uh, is one of the elements, and there are many other things that we need to look at it, as I mentioned, about the finance, transition to uh, clean technologies, and etc. Eventually, all these things would actually help us to build systemically more shock resistant you know economy and the society that we will actually have to face this uh, the long term crisis of climate change thank you excellent points joy ho oh, any final reflections on whether this changes how much does this change things um well i, I don't know whether there's much more i can add i think everyone's given such excellent comments um certainly i think it does i don't know about the change but certainly puts us in the need to rethink and reflect how we respond. And in that response, you know, it may seem a hard thing to say right now, but it, it requires more international cooperation and to come back to uh, multilateralism as the, the model that will guarantee us more security, uh, peace and economic prosperity. And um, so that, that would be, I think, the direction if, uh, mm we should change, we should change towards that because for quite a number of years, we've been moving away from that. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Ho. Push myself off. Thank you very much, Ho. And Larry, any sort of final reflections on the changes we're going to, we are seeing or could see? Um, yeah, I'd add that um, rather than backsliding, we really need uh, governments to uh, accelerate their work on this agenda in, in response to the current moment and um, use this moment to deliver concrete and bold action to end fossil fuel subsidies. And one of the key things that can help um, in uh, making progress on these issues is actually um, research combined with public pressure. And I'd say that a public debate on these issues is not only warranted because um, uh, all people are affected by fossil fuel subsidies and, and fossil fuel subsidy reform, it can also um, be very effective in helping uh, build progress uh, on these issues. So um, that's the final thing that I'd add, that um, we do need that research combined with public pressure and a public debate um, uh, to make progress, whether it's at the domestic level or at the, at the uh, multilateral level. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Larry. And I think we, we bring the, the workshop to a close today. Um, fantastic summary from all the panellists. Uh, please put your hands together if you're in the room, put your hands together virtually if you're not, and thank the panellists. And uh, there's a lot to do still on the fossil subsidy thing, but we can see there's a community here and a, a direction of, of action, so I'm sure we'll be successful. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Peter, for the excellent moderation. Just bring a few more events coming up in the next days to your attention. Um, one being the launch tomorrow of the, the Geneva, um, it's coming next. So this week we will be discussing yeah, the Geneva Blue Talk, sorry, in preparation of the UN Ocean Conference, um, uh, kicking off uh, tomorrow, organized in, co in collaboration with Portugal and Kenya. And um, the, the session next week, uh, on Tuesday next week, we'll look at another trade-related subject, which are the fisheries societies. Uh, in those trade discussions, and this week uh, many delegates are busy at WTO with the with the Fish Week, and then also bringing to your attention that um, um, we have a few other discussions ongoing here this week. One is the preparation of the the the, the plastic um, open end working group, uh, kicking off the the negotiations for a, a, an agreement to end plastic pollution. 
uh, we have the briefing on, on the preparations of the negotiations that will take place in Dakar at the end of this month, uh, uh, briefing coming up this Thursday, sorry. And next week, another event related to, uh, to the topic that we have discussed today is a, a presentation of um, uh, a report that Switzerland wants to, would like the IPCC uh, to, to present on, on the climate tipping points uh, and the need justifying also the need for this uh, fossil fuel uh, subsidies uh, um, uh, reform. Uh, and then a few other things coming up, uh, just uh, um, uh, don't hesitate to visit our website. Sorry for this minute of uh, publicity for our events. And thank you for all of the numerous people who were online with us uh, today and also the least who are still with us, they are leaving now the room. And for those who have uh, helped uh, preparing this session, there were also many people involved in the preparation of this session. The summary of this event and the recording will be available on the webpage of the event. The link has been um, shared in the chat for who is, was with us online and for those who are in the room, it's on the webpage uh, that where you found the description of this event that you will find the summary.